Hey Wargamers, welcome back to the channel, Death From Above Wargaming. I'm Aaron, and I'm here with Tom and Dave. It's another wonderful Sunday morning as we approach the springtime. Uh, actually, we're approaching the summertime. We're well into the spring at this point. Uh, April 21st, Tom. Um, April 21st. Wonderful day. So anyway, today we're talking about 3D printing again. It was so controversial and so juicy uh, that we decided to do yet another episode on it. In fact, I was explicitly told to walk away from the topic. So I didn't. Uh, we decided to do part two. Uh, so we're going to start out with a little comment of the month, my favorite. We don't do these very often. You are so mean. In fact, it was... It, we had so many great comments, and as Tom and I like to say a lot, thank you so much for the engagement. Uh, but there were two particular awesome. comments that I wanted to uh, that I wanted to bring, that I wanted to bubble to the top, if you will. Uh, the first one is from a gentleman named Padre Speaks. I assume it's a gentleman, as his name is Padre Speaks. But sorry if I if I got that wrong. Uh, so he says. Someone gave me a TLDR of this video, and it verges on a boomer take with hardly any knowledge of 3D printing. Uh, Stick to what you know. Speak to more people who print the models and their customers before releasing something like this. So, like, that's a fair point, except for you didn't even watch the video. Um, but I will say, he did eventually watch the video. He didn't change his opinion, but thanks for the view and thanks for the interaction. I appreciate, I appreciate it. it. Uh, so the other comment, Tom, is from Mr. Beeps, one of our favorites. Wait, we're not uh, just gonna, we're just not gonna go through that comment one by one. We're gonna, we're just gonna, we're just gonna let it fly. I just want okay. everybody to know that if you enjoy this episode, you can thank Padre Speaks because he was the guy that told me never to talk about this again and inspired me to do part two. Um, so, like I, I like said, it. the comments are great and I appreciate them. And everybody is entitled to their opinion but I'm entitled not to like them. But this comment from Mr. Beeps I really liked. He said, I see today's 3D printing advocates a lot like the Linux proponents of the early 2000s. You can view them however you want. Visionaries, radicals, pioneers, or trend chasers. But get on my level, boys. I'm sculpting life-size toms out of butter so I can use the HOV lane. <laughs> yeah. I uh, perfect. I got that framed on my wall now. <laughs> it's so it's good. One of my favorite comments of all time. Fantastic. Like just imagine like the butter kind of melting. And he's constantly like trying <laughs> to smack it back into shape as he's like driving, like you know, just like sculpting good. your nose yeah. in real time. <laughs> yeah, it just keeps like falling. It's too good. Oh my god, it's so good. Uh, so yeah. thank you, thank you, Mr. Beeps, and thank it's you, good. Padre Speaks. Hey, that rhymes. I'm a poet. I didn't even know Mr. it. Mr. Beeps. Uh, <laughs> So listen, so many people got all flustered about this this 3D printing thing. We're going to talk about it in detail. Just being um, misunderstood. Just totally misunderstood. Much like the last yeah. one about gatekeepers. Dare I even say that out loud? It's just like you should not have said that word. Shouldn't have said it. Uh, but listen, guys, like this is great. We're engaging you in conversation. But I'm going to do something even better this time. I am throwing down the gauntlet. There's an open challenge. All right. So many of you were like, no way, man. My 3D printer is the coolest thing and I can print the best models. That's indestructible. I dare you. Ship it to me. I want to smash it on camera. And if it survives, you get a hundred dollar Amazon gift card. It's going to happen. What? If you're interested, Aaron at DFAWarGaming.com. I will send you the studio's mailing address. Send it. If we get a whole bunch of them, we'll do a big video. I will okay. smash them live on camera. But before Wait. we do that, I'm going to prime them, and I'm going to slap them uh, with a little speed paint, Tom, and we can see just how high quality these models really are. All right? Do we and have when to you smash send it, them? Oh, I'm going to smash them. good? Oh. Well, then they get a $100 gift card. <laughs> it's just that simple. Put your money where your mouth is. Ship us one of your finest models. All right? Uh, I expect I expect you to use the finest dental plaster or whatever the hell it is that you use to print indestructible Maybe models. Resin, right? uh, I, I want to see it. <laughs> All right. We so, also want to know. We also want to know what resin you use. Absolutely. So when you email me, I will send you. I want to know the yeah. printer. I want to know the resin. I want to know it all. So yeah. we're gonna do it. Uh, we'll do a whole video on it, and we're gonna see how good it is. Now, um, let's get into our ready room. Round table. All right, this is where the rubber meets the road. Um, so again, Dave is a is an avid three D printer. He actually, does a ton of three D printing for the channel and painting as well. Uh, he just actually printed uh, some excellent stuff from Thunderhead Studios. 
uh, and I have some some models that he printed up for me as well. Um, so so Dave knows a thing or two about printing. Unlike unlike me, I'm just a silly boomer who knows nothing. Um, but a couple of things that I want to bring up before we really get into the discussion. Remember, the intent of the last video was really to talk about whether or not 3D printing was a threat to Catalyst Game Labs. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, but really, I want to dig into some of the, the comments that were made. And again, there were so many comments, so much engagement, so many good ones. There's a couple of big, though, like things we need to pull apart. I think there was a lot of, a lot of conversation, a lot of ideas that were conflated. Um, and I want to make sure we pull those apart. So the first one is this, um, you know, printing for home is right. It can be done by anybody that is just, Hey, I bought a hundred dollar printer on Amazon to some guy who, you know, again, left a really good comment, but he was citing his, you know, 12 K $850 printer that takes up 60% of his basement. Like there's a difference there. Like you're not, you're more than a hobbyist. You're like a real, you're like an enthusiast. You're very deep in the weeds you know, if you're running like these high intensity printers and, you know, to me and Dave, I'm interested in your perspective and Tom will go to you to me. Like that's like saying, Hey, cars don't really do well over, over 110 miles an hour. And then Tom freaking out and citing his, you know, his Lamborghini because it does great over 110 miles an hour, like uh -huh. cool. But how many people really have that? So again, educate boomer Aaron, help me understand Dave. What do you think? in terms of, you know, the hobbyist, the average consumer, so on and so forth. So I, I, I would consider myself a hobbyist when it comes to 3D printing, and I'm able to, to turn out some very passable, you know, models, terrain, what have you. Um, I don't have a crazy printer. I have a budget resin printer. Um, I've tuned it. I've, I'm, you know, into thousands of models printed. Awesome. Uh, but that being said, so I don't have a crazy So when you say tuning, setup. what does that mean? Uh, set it, or setting exposure times, making sure that you're using the right resin, making sure that you're printing, you know, at appropriate temperatures. You know, you're not trying to do it in the in a cold ass garage in the middle of winter. Um, it, it's really just what about like tweaking. modding? Like I, yeah, I was gonna say I see people like changing the print bed material and like adding different like metal pieces and upgrading their machines. Is that different from oh, tuning? Because like for the car world. You know, right. You're, you're thinking a lot about FDM rather than resin. Um, when okay. it comes to resin, there's there's very few mods that I'm aware of that you can make to printers. Sure, there's, oh, you know, you're changing your film, which is just recommended no matter what which resin printer you're, you're doing. But that's a, you know, five to ten dollar change. Um, nice. Other than that, it's just the print material. And now what? Okay. Yeah. So when print material is the resin. Correct. Okay. Is there a huge range of resins in terms oh of like gosh, price yes. points or are they more like applications? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Is it like so, one's a hundred, one's 10 or are they all about um, 10, but it's like, no, do you use the right one? It's you use the right one for the right application. So different resins are formulated to do different things. Um, some are very bendy. Some are very brittle. Um, some, you know, ranging in price. I was just shopping today you can get a, a kilogram of resin for 17.99 uh but you can go much more expensive you know pushing closer to, to 50 60 bucks for the same amount now um if you wanted to buy like a dime bag of resin from a street dealer what would that be no i'm kidding <laughs> like if i want an eight ball i mean of you're resin, charging like, a premium what, what, yep. <laughs> yeah. so really so if i could summarize from like again my like yeah. i don't really know perspective um not understanding like using the right resins is is like a rookie mistake that leads to bad prints not having the environment set up correctly it does also yeah like you just you just set the thing in the room you don't even think about the environment and you're getting middling right. but if if you take some time like how close do you think you can get to like production quality versus like amateur quality with like the machine you have oh relatively quickly um the community is out there and they're very very hopeful with getting stuff dialed in um there's even test prints that help you configure your your printer um and that points you to like use. what the mistakes are is that kind of absolutely like, yep. depending on what happens that's cool and Perfect. now um i don't know if you i don't want to jump forward but what about the software because i remember that also being kind of tricky like what software you use is that pretty much easy these days it's 
pretty standardized at this point. Okay. When you buy a printer, it comes with a, a recommended slicer. Um, and again, if you just for some reason hate it completely, there are alternates out there. Most are free. Yeah. Well, but like, so it's pretty easy. And then like an STL file is um, readable by any of them. There's no compatibility Correct. issues. Like, awesome. So, nope. cool. yeah. And there's, there's, you know, entire libraries and stores available online that are just aggregators for those STLs, um, whether it's Thingiverse, My Mini Factory, uh, Colts is, is one that I do we, use Do we have to bleep all those names out? Are we going to get in not. trouble? Beep. Um, now, <laughs> the last part is the difference between like FDM and resin. Like how big of a gap is it between those style of like filament printers versus resin? When it comes to detail, in my opinion, there's a pretty large gap. Um, and that's really down to the resolution that the printer is able to handle. Um, when you're using a resin, you're, you're much more finely detailed. You can get much sharper prints. Using an FDM or a filament printer um, is ideal for things like terrain. Oh, yeah, but bigger bigger things, less detail. Um, you're going to see some terrain on the channel that's FDM printed. Um, right. But the, the very first step that I did with it, and I... I know it's not the most recommended. Uh, I hate sanding, so instead I used automotive filler primer to uh, smooth out my layer lines from my FDM. I, I just bought a ton of that for uh, 3D printed terrain. Uh, Rust-Oleum mm -hmm. makes a really good like yeah. filler primer. It fills it in um, really well. Yep. Yeah, and then you're supposed yeah. to hit it. Thunderhead recommends, actually on their site they talk about it. Uh, I think they said three coats um, usually does the trick, and you don't have to mm -hmm. sand at that point. I mean, you might if you're a perfectionist, but largely that will that will cover most of the imperfections. Yeah, sure. And now, so and the resin printers work with a laser, right? Is that the lasers heating the resin in specific pinpoints, or is it using UV light or so, something? How is this? UV light. Yes, you got it. So uh, if you if you remember, you know, since since we're boomers, uh, if you remember DLP <laughs> televisions. Uh, where yeah. it shines a light onto a mirror. The mirror reflects through an LCD screen. Mm -hmm. uh, so the LCD screen uh, goes black right. where it, it can't show the light. And then anywhere where the UV light is reflected up into the resin, it cures the, those areas, which is how you get your individual layers. Very cool. That's, awesome. That's very cool. We're, and, and, we're, so, and, we're... and so the whole time the print bed's moving up so that the, the laser is shining on the same layer, but the piece is actually moving. Is that right? Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. The print so that's how you get bed the actually goes up and down and as or it will come down and meet the the film at the bottom. It will shine the light for a few seconds, then it will move, reset, shine the light again, and cure the next layer. That's cool. Very cool. Like yeah, that. that's really cool. So like all of this stuff is great information and I love what you said about, you know, the sort of the community out there, right? That's that's willing to support and ready to support, right? Oh, it's, um, new printers, it's like incredible. New, new hobbyists, if you will. Um, that's, a, that's a really cool thing. And I think this is a good segue into, you know, one of those conflated issues, right? Well, sort of a dividing line for me, which is I'm printing for myself and, and, you know, and my buddies maybe, right? And that's, I think that's okay. To me, you know, that's a lot like cardboard standees or using proxies, right? Um, and then on the other side of that, that is like, I print to sell. Now, there's, again, there's a whole IP thing in there. Sometimes it's okay. Sometimes it's not. And we're not even really going to go into that. But when we talked about crap prints and Tom, Tom and I's experience, and I'll be honest with you, between the last video and this one, I ordered three off of Etsy from three different vendors, and they were all absolute junk. So I stand by my boomer comment of what I said most of the eBay prints, most of the Etsy prints are junk. And connecting the dots between what you just said, Dave, they're not spending the money on expensive resin. Right. They're not taking the time to print it out. They are min-maxing their profits, right? And it's junk, period. Deal with it, people. Now, I also cited in the last uh, episode, Sage Print Labs. Fantastic. Mm. Okay, fantastic models. They actually use high-quality resin. We've reviewed them on the channel. Uh, they're at, they're absolutely tremendous. So there are vendors out there, yes, um, but there are there are few and far between. In fact, SagePrint is the only one. Polygon was very good, but again, they're not around anymore. Uh, but SagePrint is the only one uh, that I've that I've tried. Tom and you remember you were like trying to break it on the channel. I think in the review, uh, and we couldn't break it. 
So they're out there, but 80% stink, period. This is the stuff you buy on Etsy and eBay. If you're printing at home, I think it's very different. Um, so I think that's an important thing. To, and I'm sticking, I'm, I'm putting a line in the sand there. If you, if you disagree with me, you can email me and point me to an Etsy or eBay vendor that actually sells good 3D printed models because I have not yeah. found one. Yeah, and I mean, and that, and that just goes to sort of more of the point of that is that within the entire marketplace, if you can't just pick a vendor and get a decent print, if you have to like really search for one or two out of 10 or 20 that are good, right? that doesn't, you know, that that's a problem for the consumer, right? So yeah. there's all and these different facets of this. Yeah. Unrelated to the, to the breakability or whatever, the quality of the resin, the scale sucks. It's like no different than buying from, you know, dare I say iron wind, you don't really know what the scale is going to be when you buy one of those models. Um, and, and so it's not, it's not different to me. The, the thing that I love about the Catalyst Minis, and yes, they have mold lines. Yes, some of them are melty and aren't perfect, right? But they're all the same scale. They're all the same design aesthetic. Like, you know what you're going to get, and that's what I like. And I think there's a large community of players within Battletech that just want to go to a store and buy something, right? And, and know what they're going to get, to your point, Tom. Not like, oh, is this, <laughs> is this print going to actually be garbage or not, right? And I think that's largely what we were talking about, us boomers, we were talking about in the last one, is the stuff you buy, not the at-home hobbyist, right? Yeah. Well, um, and then there was the, yeah, I mean, that was part of it, right? We sort of got into, is that a model for Catalyst to sell STLs directly, which- Oh, man, people you love know, that idea. The Hero, the hero yeah, Forge oh, model. It would be fantastic. spectacular. Yeah. As and, I, I'm and a then, full and supporter then that got of in, that idea. It'd be awesome, right? Yeah, and then- so good. A lot of people brought up some like IP issues, right? Different mm -hmm. rights that I guess Tops wasn't interested in talking about. I don't know. Again, it's all gossip, right? We love to gossip. We're yeah, I mean, I mean, there there was Rem had mentioned cats. it in her interview with Sarna that Tops didn't want to have the conversation, but what that could mean one of about twelve billion different things, right? Maybe it's not good time. Maybe they just don't want to have it wasn't the conversation. A serious conversation. Yeah. Maybe because they just have this plastic line, they don't want to introduce complexity. Who knows what it actually means? I don't think it's off the table. I just think right now it's not something that they're interested in. But a comment somebody made about proxy models is that many of the source books reference proxy models, right? Proxy models have been in play for a very long time. We have cardboard standees. We have little, you know, chips with mech faces on them. Like that genie can't be put in the bottle was what the quote said. And I thought that's that one stuck with me. That's not, that's not going away, and we need to embrace it, and I think we need to welcome it, and here's why. Several of our friends in the international community, uh, they made a great point about mechs not being available, right? Just Catalyst products not being available in their country, um, period, right? And, I, and I'm sure, you know, whether there's shipping issues or logistics or maybe there's just not high volume, whatever it might be, um, there's definitely, um, you know, our, our friends abroad that don't have the same access that we have here in the U.S., right? And and do we exclude them from, you know, um, you know, are they not welcome to the party, right? Like, what what do we do about that? So that's the topic I want to I want to talk about next. Just spend a couple of minutes, Tom. Let's start with you, and then Dave, you can weigh in on that one. Yeah. So the one topic, the one point to that I would make is, so I think Catalyst did try to straddle that fence a bit, where they said like, hey, in our official channels, we don't want that kind of content. But they never said that they don't like they're not going to go after people 3d printing their own minis that right. post like they're it's almost like fan art right and mm -hmm. i i really think there's a big place for that like like dave how much would you say a print cost you like you've already invested in the machine for a thousand other reasons you want to mm -hmm. print a battletech mini how much would it cost you a couple cents a dollar yeah a, a quarter there you go. So like if you if you draw your own mini, maybe it's not perfect, whatever, but like you put blocks together in a 3D modeler and you print out a little blocky mech, like great. And you call it a battle mech, a battle master, right? Uh, mm -hmm. To play at home games. You're not, again, you're not trying to sell it on Etsy, anything like that. There's just, there's right. not a world where I don't understand that as completely fair use, right? Yeah, honestly, it, it's unfortunate that, you know, we do, People overseas do not have the widespread distribution that we see here. You know, any of the Barnes and Noble exclusives, like they just can't get them. Um, yeah. I think it is a massive 
you know, feather in the hat of CGL that you've got people who are passionate enough about the game that they're seeking out alternates to get, you know, the little miniatures that they love. Um, that only furthers the the game as a whole. Right. Um, I just, I wish, you know, that they could, you know, walk into a store and buy it the same as, you know, us here in the U S. Mm-hmm. Um, and I buy a lot too. Like I own everything that the catalyst has put out as far as a miniature. Um, now if I, if I didn't even have that as an output, then 3d printing would be the only way that I could, I could be able to do this. So That's right. I, I think it's, it's tough. It's, it's impossible to stop at this point. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. And and you know, I have mixed feelings about the the sort of official channel thing. I mean, I, I guess I definitely understand. Like, hey, we want to push our own product. This is our Catalyst Game Labs channel. We only want to see our products, you know, in here. Um, but but I do think that is a little bit of a slippery slope. And and I, I'm just to be clear, like I'm not unsupportive of them saying that. But I do think it is an, is a bit of a slippery slope where. <laughs> You know, like if you remember with Games Workshop, it was like if if there if it was like somebody else's terrain in the picture, like when Pegasus or whatever that company was had those goofy like knockoff 40k, right? Like, where do you draw that line? And and I don't want to see BattleTech, and I think a lot of people don't want to see BattleTech become like an over policed franchise, right? And I think that's I think there's sort of like a chain reaction of of freaking out. Um, uh, yeah, that's where it comes from, for right? Sure. Yeah. All right. So one other one other final use case that I think, uh, you know, several people brought this one up. I, I call it the Pouncer Battlemaster use case because they're mechs that you can only get in the box set right now. OK, the Pouncer comes in, the you know, $80 or $70 Alpha Strike box set and the Battlemaster comes in the game of armored combat. You can't get them anywhere else right now. I have all my mechs, you know, I'm, I'm going to a tournament or whatever. My, my stuff's already painted. I, I have my Capellans. I really want a Battlemaster. Like, what do I do? Do I go buy a $60 box set for one mech and throw out the rest? Or like, I know you can buy the reinforcements thing. It's 40 bucks and you just get the mechs. But like, should I have to do that? Or, you know, is it easier for me to just rip out a 3D print of a Battlemaster for a quarter, right? And call it a day. Um, so I don't know. Let's, let's, Dave, let's start with you. Uh, I think I know what your opinion is on this, but, you know, what do you think about of that? Of course you do. <laughs> uh, uh, honestly, I, you need one mech. You, you don't need eight max or 12 max. Right. Um, I, I, I'm completely okay with it. I'm still playing the game. You know, I'm still enjoying it. Um, you know, not everybody has an, a, an extra $80 to throw down on buying right. a new set. Um, right. I mean, buying a, buying a printer and getting the stuff for it is a, is an investment for sure. You know, it's not cheap, but as I said, you know, run, ripping off a, a battle master is a quarter. <laughs> it's not um it cer- certainly wouldn't break the bank um and i'm i'm not trying to take anything away from catalyst as i said i buy all of their models that come out um but there are definitely gaps in the model range yeah tom what do you think um yeah i <laughs> i don't even know i have i've yeah i have no problem with it well why don't we segue into our patron I, Q&A here? Because this is actually a relevant Q&A, and I think you're going to answer sure. the Q&A question with what you're about to say, because I'm, okay. I'm reading yeah, your mind fair. right now. Uh, so this this patron Q&A, say what? this is from Rugged Finn, and he says, mm. how would you, if given full control, make individual mechs available to be bought outside of force packs, or worse yet, the box sets? I need several Thunderbolts and Phoenix Hawks, he says. So, um, Tom, I mean, what do you think about that? Like, how how could we? So, I would solve yeah. this battle max pouncer pro, the battle master pouncer problem differently. Like, if I were Catalyst, like I would solve it by making it available, right? Like, wh- what would you do? How would you make it available? Okay, so yes, this kind of goes into. It's funny. I'm gonna twist it in my way because what I was thinking about was the unavailable mechs, the mechs that don't exist anywhere mm. yet. Yeah. Um, and a, a big delay in getting a new mech to market is in the production logistics. I think their 3D prints, or uh, I'm sorry, their 3D models could be done months ahead of when a mini could actually be produced, right? Which mm-hmm. says to me, you know, when you're talking about individual mechs, a great model would be the Hero Forge. I mean, it was the 
the, so, the point I, I made. Going. I knew it. It's just, I mean, they could even, honestly, if they don't even want to release them, I, I that wasn't even the point I was making about like STLs to consumers. Mm-hmm. I was saying they have a website, they print it themselves, and then they package it up and ship it out. Um, that'd be perfect. Right. Like a like you know? a five week lead time or like a four week lead time on a made to order Mac. Yeah. And you ship it out right. in a little salvage box to me. They they get a premium price for that. And then and then the second tier of that would be once those three D prints are available on this design website, would be, you know, packaged minis like um Reaper minis or something like that, right? Like you can buy and D and D does it too. D and D has individual right. mech, you know. The interesting thing is the three D models for these mechs are done. Like those are the renders that we see. Um all they would right. need to do is make those available and charge a premium. Like I will pay you charge me $15 for, for an STL of a battle master. Um, I think what's scary about that is once they release the official STL, there are going to be S- or Etsy stores that pop up selling quote unquote yeah. official. Um, and I, yeah. I, I think that's a valid use case to not release them, but the hero <laughs> forge idea really, especially printing them in house and custom shipping them, yeah, you're. It would make a ton of money. And again, and I don't want to make the point. I mean, off camera, we were talking, and and I I will gently make this point too: is that there's such a focus on eco-friendly manufacturing and consumerism uh, that you know the need to produce giant boxes, ship them across the world. You know, it's not necessary anymore. It's it's really a, a financial and a logistics decision that people make and how they want to run their business. And it, again, it's fine. I have no problem with it. But you know, it's just another sort of, you know, if you care about that stuff, that should factor into these decisions in some way. So yeah, it's, it's and, an and China is not it. No, and China as a manufacturer is not it. I yeah. No, I mean it's a, it's a it's another contra. Do we have to do another? We'll have to do another jump jump point on that because that's gonna it's gonna torpedo the comments section but it's a great so, it's an somebody excellent spiked point. my seltzer no i'm kidding it's, just, <laughs> it's, it's a seltzer. valid I point think. like i mean i i didn't even really think about like and i was talking about what do i do with the other you know seven mechs do i throw them out but think about like all the money involved in the packaging the shipping the you know the back and forth from china like there's a lot of money that went into getting that thing to your doorstep just for a single mech when you can press yeah. print right and rip one of these things off and about you know how long does it take tell dave you. Uh, three and a half hours on my printer. Amazon can't even compete with that. Yeah. Same day well, let me, shipping. And l- let me, not, yeah. not yet. <laughs> <laughs> How about not we get the off the soapbox and we get into the render blender? All right. So I got a good one here uh, for you tonight. Is this Tom. a solar powered blender? Or... No, this, uh, <laughs> it's a blender powered by all of my leftover boxes that I composted. Uh, <laughs> You're like burning them in a pit. <laughs> Yeah, it's good. <laughs> it's not a coal-fired power plant. It's a catalyst box-fired <laughs> uh, power plant. All right, so check it out. Speaking of power, we're looking at the mm. Blood Asp. Now, uh, this oh, is coming out in the God. new Kickstarter, all right? Yep. And uh, this is this is like a salvage box one. It doesn't come in any lance or anything like that, right? Dave, I'm pretty sure this is just like an individual uh, that is, yeah, that is produced. Yeah, you buy a Blood Asp. Yep. So I'm going to bring this guy up full screen, Tom. All right, Ooh, I got baby. three renders. <sighs> Courtesy of our of our friend Anthony Scroggins, it's a Shimmering Sword on Patreon. If you want to get access Dude, to all of these awesome things the here, all right. Yeah, so Tom, take it take it away. What do you think, Thomas? Uh, this is one of the nastiest looking mechs I think he has, or Catalyst has produced. I should say, great job on this with those two like shoulder mounted like. Oh my God! What are they? What is the armament on this thing? Is, is this an assault mech, or not? It is. It is a ninety oh, okay. ninety ton clan omni mech. Oh, can I see some more pictures of this thing? Wow. Oh, and I was saying too. You know, at first I didn't think its head was mid mounted. I thought it had like a cool cyclops head. Like up here. Um, but I think that's is that the medium pulse laser? What or is that just I, like? So I think it's two heavy lasers and a pulse in the arm. The Gauss. I thought I it had these six just... heavies. It's got four heavies. Oh, uh, okay. I thought it had six. Okay. Yeah, four heavy mediums and two medium pulse. I think they're all okay. in the arms. Um, I'd have to yeah, look that would make sense specifically. Then. Dude, I love the foot. I think that's the first time I've seen like a bear claw style foot. That's super cool. Yeah. Um, 
it, like and it really looks like articulated like it looks like the two outer claws can move independently like very nice sculpting there very nice mm-hmm. design um yeah. the the location of that streak srm6 is so cool i could imagine almost like a voltron where the head like pops up and like shows it you know or it has like a sweet it, maybe it has like a sweet cod piece that opens up you know it's like, <laughs> wow oh my god that, that's like, what uh, that's probably what this is right here yeah who's the guy from dust from dust till dawn uh, um sex machine right uh tom savini when his uh he's got the belt thing that pops open with the gun no i don't okay mm-hmm. it looks awesome. <laughs> yeah. you guys know what i'm you talking about right yeah okay thank oh you. my god i i love this like i don't know what this yeah. is supposed to be but it almost looks like like a mount adjustment like for the gauss rifles yeah no, like a like a ratcheting exactly adjustment of yeah it's really cool. What's the next? Do we have another picture of its butt? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's kind of a flat butt. Uh, it's kind of a, you know, Karen butt. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> I do like that he, you can see that he put the, the Urban Mech uh, on the upper back. You see it right there? Yeah. I feel like he puts an Easter egg of Urban Mechs into all of his designs now. Just to it's just like the people. ploys in Urban Mech. Like if you press, if you <laughs> press just... this button, it just bounces out. It's like, it's like <laughs> shockwave from Transformers when the, when like Ravage yes. would come out of his chest and buzzsaw. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Oh, it's, or like, it's how you eject. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine? Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, man, this is a, a knockout of the park. I can't wait to paint this thing either. Like it looks so good. Oh, yeah, man. When are I we mean, getting this? Is this in the Kickstarter? Or? It, it is. Yeah, yeah, it's in the Kickstarter. And it's funny, like, your reaction to this is, like, spot on to mine. I, yeah. It's just so badass. There's really no jokes you can really make about it, minus the cod piece. I now, mean, it is, is there just an old, an old blast. Is there an IWM I version? I don't know that see. there is, to be quite honest. I'd have to go on their website and look, but... Um, I'm not, I, I think this might be a yep. brand new sculpt, but then again, Nope, there is one. Wait, you got to <laughs> Oh that. my God. Now that's much closer to the new sculpt, right? It's the armaments, the same, the weapon placements and everything. I mean, it looks um, ridiculous. It still has the, it still has the, look how narrow its hips head are. Head like if you compare this to the new design, it's, it's a very good, there's some homage points to it, right? It's. It yeah, like I mean, you can see the Gauss away. rifles; they have these little things, right? Yeah, because mm. I was gonna say, like, when I first looked at, it, I was like, this feels like a departure from a lot of other designs. Um, like the size of the guns on its shoulders are are almost cartoonish compared to some of the more realistic BattleTech designs. Mm-hmm. But uh, I also love having a couple of them. Like I think yeah. of the Night Star and stuff; those other kind of right, almost some... cartoonishly villainous, like. It's you so know, big villainous. boss man. Yeah, I love it's it. It's a great. That's yeah. a great. It's a great. Like word he doesn't for look it. like a good guy, right? And his name's no, Bloodass. I'm, it looks like a bad mech. Yeah, it's gonna be a bad guy. This Smoke Jaguar, I think. I'm gonna paint it in Smoke Jaguar oh, colors. They're always think? bad guys. No offense. They're always the bad guys. To my clan brethren, but um, but that's yeah. it. We're gonna wrap up this episode. So as always, please leave your comments. Let us know what you think about all of this 3D printing hubbub. Um, and tell me if you're interested in joining our challenge. All right. I'm dead serious. hundred dollar Amazon gift card to the winner. Yeah. Uh, if it paints nice and I can't smash it, you win. All right. Okay. If, if you don't want your mini smashed email, Tom at DFA Wargaming. And no, then those <laughs> I'm entries, smashing I it. I mean, I'm going to have the like goggles on, on and we're going to have a hammer and we are going to smash them on camera. But here's my question: Do, Don't the wouldn't the catalyst injection mold it? Oh, I'll smash. I'll work up. We'll test one of those too. Okay, there we go. All right, yeah, we'll do that. I got I got forty two thousand executioners and salvage boxes. They're just waiting to be smashed. I am. Uh, I'm going to make a plug for Ares games and minis. Uh, if you do want to get minis, dice, fantastic three D printed terrain, uh, anything along those lines to fuel your battle tech addiction, head on over to Ares games and minis. Uh, also, if you liked what you heard, you can subscribe, you can like, and as we said, please leave a comment. Even if it's nasty, I love reading them. Uh, and lastly, if you want to help out the channel uh, and keep the lights on, you can head on over to Patreon. It's as little as $1 a month to get in on the action. And thank you to all of our fantastic patrons out there. Uh, without you guys, we wouldn't be doing it. So thank you very much. That said, I'm all done. Guys, go out there, enjoy some sunshine on this wonderful Sunday. Thank you so much for watching, and of course, stay tuned. Always great stuff coming from Death From Above Wargaming. Have a good one.